All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And thank you for attending today's webinar on key elements of trusted collaboration and information sharing. My name is Jake Swanson, and I'm a program coordinator at the U.S. Energy Association, uh, working on the Energy Utility Partnership Program based in Washington, D.C. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and all participants are muted with their video turned off. You're welcome and encouraged to post questions either in the chat or the Q&A box below. We'll be monitoring them and passing them on to our presenters as appropriate. Uh, just to give a brief background on USEA, we're a nonprofit membership association of public and private energy related organizations, corporations, and government agencies. USEA represents the broad interests of the US energy sector by increasing the understanding of energy issues, both domestically and internationally through capacity building activities and events like this one. The series of webinars is financed through our cooperative agreement with USAID, the Energy Utility Partnership Program, and in particular through USAID's Bureau for Economic Growth, Education and Environment, E3 Bureau. Uh, this is the 14th webinar in our series on digitalization and cybersecurity. You can find past recordings uh, of webinars on our website at usca.org slash events. And you can scroll to the bottom to see all past events. Please join us next week for our 15th and final webinar in the series on communication strategies before, during, and after cyber attacks uh, that will address a variety of communication strategies and practices that energy regulators and utilities can adopt to prepare for and respond to a cyber attack. Next, Kristen Madler from the US Agency for International Development will make some brief opening remarks. Thanks, Jake, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kristen Madler. I'm a senior energy advisor with USAID's Global Energy and Infrastructure Office, and I manage the Business Innovation Partnership Initiative under which this webinar series is being carried out and hosted through our partnership with USCA. I'd like to thank our colleagues at USCA for their work in organizing today's webinar. So cybercrime damages costs are predicted to hit $6 trillion annually by 2021. As a result, the cybersecurity market has grown exponentially in recent years and global spending on cybersecurity products and services are estimated to exceed $1 trillion cumulatively over five years from 2017 up until 2021. In today's webinar, Frank Honkis, Associate Director of Intelligence Programs, will share the mission and vision of the North American Sharing and Analysis Center, or EISAC, as well as how their members collaborate through the Cyber Risk Information information sharing program or CRISP. And specifically, he will dig into how security data is gathered, analyzed, and shared with stakeholders. We'll learn how ISAC coordinates incident management and communicates mitigation strategies with stakeholders. We'll also hear from the utility beneficiaries perspective. We are joined by Tom Wilson, Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer of Southern Company. We would like to thank Tom and his team for their support for this webinar series. Southern Company staff have contributed to two previous webinars on cybersecurity considerations for distributed renewable energy resources and utility maturity assessment tools. If you haven't had a chance to attend those two or other webinars in the series, please visit USDA's website for their recordings and also to download their presentations. On behalf of USAID, I would like to thank both of our presenters for joining us today. I also would like to remind everyone that next week we will hold our final 15th webinar. It will take place on November 4th, which is next Wednesday as opposed to when we usually hold these on Thursdays, and it will begin at 9.30 a.m. Um, Eastern time. So please mark your calendars to join us for two cybersecurity industry panels. These will be held on November 18th and December 2nd. The panels will feature representatives of leading US cybersecurity firms that will discuss international trends and cutting edge tools and resources for cyber threats, intrusion detection and testing and cyber risk management through measurement. More details will be posted for the upcoming panels on USDA's website. 
And for utility representatives who are watching this webinar, please write to us if you would like to join USAID's Business Innovation Partnership Initiative, where we will support utility champions to integrate innovative technology to better meet increasing customer expectations, to effectively adopt new business models, and to improve business process and procedures, including those that are designed to help utilities to better prepare and manage cyber risk. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We really value all your questions and your feedback. And with that, I'll give the floor back to Jake. Thank you, Kristen. Um, again, today's webinar is on uh, key elements of trusted collaboration and information sharing. Today's presenters will discuss the purpose of an information sharing and analysis center, ISAC, as well as how their members collaborate. Um, as Kristen mentioned, today we have the pleasure of having Tom Wilson, who is uh, Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer for Southern Company, uh, which is one of America's largest producers of clean, safe, reliable, and affordable energy. Tom is responsible for managing corporate cybersecurity risk and developing best practices uh, that further the company's cybersecurity and resilience. Tom joined Southern Company in 1989 and has 30 years of experience. Um, He's a member of an executive advisory council responsible for advancing the Department of Energy initiatives in the corporate sector and serves on the executive committee for the Electricity Information Sharing Center and Analysis, Sharing and Analysis Center, EISAC, um, which is actually where Frank works. So Frank is uh, the Associate Director of Intelligence Programs and the Program Manager uh, of the Cybersecurity Risk Information Sharing Program, CRISP, um, at EISAC. Frank supports the cybersecurity of electric utility members of CRISP through ensuring growth of the program and refinement of technical capabilities, re uh, reporting, and information sharing. Prior to joining EISAC, Frank worked at the Department of Energy analyzing CRISP data um, for malicious cyber activity. He was the red team lead and wrote the foundational mitigation and recovery sections for the joint base architecture for security industrial control systems, J basics joint test and supported the United States cyber command focusing on cyber threats to operations technology system. Um, so obviously our presenters have a, a great deal of experience today um, and we're so happy that they're joining us today. And uh, with that, I will pass it over to Frank. Thank you. I'm um, so stand by and I will bring my slides up. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for having me today. Um, so, as I was introduced, my name is Frank Conkus, and I am the Associate Director of Intelligence Programs and the Chris Program Manager at the EISAC. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, what is an EISAC or what is the ISAC, <clears throat> and there's uh, three main tenets, information sharing, partnership, and analysis for the EISAC, or for any ISAC even. Um, and then I will also speak to you about the Cybersecurity Risk Information Sharing Program, CRISP, um, uh, and, which is a private-public partnership um, between uh, the D, uh, Department, or excuse me, uh, the Department of Energy and um, the sector utilities. So first, uh, pertaining to the ISAC, so I, the, the, the EISAC is uh, part of uh, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, and the EISAC is uh, North American by nature. So we, we look at the cybersecurity and physical security across all of North America to include Canada and Mexico. Um, so uh, we, we cross borders regarding that, uh, and later in this discussion, I'll talk about some of the uh, international, other international relationships that we have. So what does the EISAC do? <clears throat> so we serve a, 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 as a cyber and physical communications channel for the electricity industry. So um, we, we collaborate with US and Canadian industry members, governments, and cross-sector partners. Uh, we gather information from our members, uh, that, that in, uh, both private and public. Uh, we analyze that information, we generate reporting, and we share that information back out. Um, for the information that is shared with us, especially from our, our private sector members, 
uh, that information is protected from any regulatory enforcement. Uh, and we do that to ensure that uh, there's no um, consequence, negative consequence to sharing uh, 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 information with the EISAC. So from an information sharing perspective, we do focus on cyber and physical. That's not to say that we don't track other things like supply chain or um, other, other aspects or areas of, of security information. Uh, but we have a, a cyber threat intelligence group and we have a physical security group. Um, the information that is shared, uh, we, we, we utilize what's called the traffic light protocol. And Tom will discuss this a little more on his slides later. Uh, but at a high level, it's it's basically an originator control that allows for how far you uh, uh, we as the ISAC are permitted to further share or distill into products um, for for our, our members. Um, uh, for information sharing channels, we I would suggest go to eisac.com uh, for more information. Um, you can also reach out to our member services at eisac.com with any questions uh, that you may have. And then finally, uh, we do have a 24 seven watch. And so that means someone's always uh, available to answer emails, take calls, uh, put in tickets, et cetera, as things, event, or as things uh, occur. So from a partnership perspective, um, so we partner, I'll start in the upper left-hand corner with um, government organizations in the United States. Department of Energy is our sector security or sector specific agency. So they're our primary partner partner with uh, Homeland Security, Department of Defense, and others. In the lower left-hand corner, we also partner with other ISACs. So uh, the National Council of ISACs, Water ISAC, the Multi-State ISAC, Downstream Natural Gas, Oil and Natural Gas ISACs. Um, and basically, we, it's collaborative uh, to share information across ISACs um, because uh, events that are occurring in electricity uh, may have footprints or, or to secondary or tertiary effects in events that are, excuse me, secondary or tertiary effects in other uh, sectors uh, and vice versa. Um, we also have our, our international ISACs. Um, so we, we have uh, memorandums of understanding between or with uh, the Japanese ISAC and the other European electric ISAC. Uh, in the, the lower right, we also partner with uh, the Canadian government. Um, so we, there is some information sharing that occurs between us and uh, the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. And then finally, we have our trade organizations. So uh, trade organizations in the United States are, are advocacy groups, and we partner with them, uh, such as NRECA, um, American Public Power Association, Edison Electric Institute, as well as uh, the Canadian Electricity Association. Uh, from a membership perspective, um, anyone in the United States, or excuse me, in North America that is an electricity uh, industry asset owner or operator can join the ISAC. We also let select government partners join the ISAC um, the, for, for information sharing purposes and portal access. Uh, our intended audience is cyber, or excuse me, security directors, cyber and physical security analysts, and general managers. Uh, that th this target audience are the individuals that would we, we believe would get the most because uh, usually it's a lot of technical information that is shared, such as indicators are compromised. Um, and those with a regulatory role can't be members of the ISAC. Um, so we, we have a, uh, a wall between ourselves and the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. Um, we have a code of conduct that, it, that it, uh, inhibits us or stops us from sharing or having to be compelled to share with NERC. Um, addition, and similarly with FERC, which is our Federal uh, Electric Reliability Corporation, um, uh, to keep out regulators, so, so as to protect our members and the information to share. Um, the benefits to joining an ISAC is, is membership is free. There is no additional cost. Um, uh, member services are customized. So we provide back security threats or information on security threats, cyber and physical bulletins, and, and we also have a pro, what we call the critical broadcast program. And this is when there's a, a significant event. We will essentially uh, set up a, 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 tel, a teleconference and reach out to organizations. We usually will have the uh, individuals from affected entities speak. We've done the, a couple of these now to, to basically get messaging out as fast as possible. 
So from there, I'll talk about a, a program that uh, EISAC is the steward of, which is called the Cybersecurity Risk Information Sharing Program, or CRISP. So CRISP is a, a private-public partnership between uh, the Department of Energy, specifically, and uh, the sector utilities that make up the membership of CRISP. And, and the concept here is that data is shared in near real-time fashion from CRISP members to the Department of Energy. And then the government leverages information sources to enrich that data and provide back reporting. Um, the EISAC's role in this is, is we are the stewards or program managers of the, of the, the CRISP program. And we also utilize a national laboratory in the United States for uh, primarily for our analysis. So what is CRISP? Uh, CRISP is uh, network sensing, big data processing, analysis, and information sharing. So from the network sensing perspective, <clears throat> the utilities that participate in CRISP have a, a sensor deployed, data is collected and sent to uh, out to the national laboratory for analysis. Um, to, to be a member of CRISP, there is a fee associated. This is this one is not free, um, but, but we have several members, and so uh, the data that comes into uh, our national laboratory <clears throat> gives us a very good perspective across the, the, the country, the United States specifically, of, of what's happening or what's being thrown at or what's affecting utilities uh, from a big data perspective. Uh, we can look across that data set looking for anomalies that stand out that might be specific to uh, the sector in general or util one new or two utilities specifically. <clears throat> we could conduct further analysis against that data and we generate reporting that goes back out to the members of CRISP. So what does CRISP provide? <clears throat> An understanding of, of threat actor motivations and intent. We specifically focus on cyber, but we can also look at physical and insider threat information or look for uh, physical and insider threat um, uh, anomalies. Um, and finally, we provide back actionable and informed reporting to the members of CRIS so that they can uh, mitigate. <clears throat> Excuse me. The products we generate are nation state and non nation state threat assessments. We, we generate these weekly, bi weekly. Uh, perhaps monthly, and we, we uh, increase or decrease production depending on current events. We generate products with indicators associated with identified threat actors and anomalies. Um, so it might be uh, attributable information, or it may be just, uh, um, you know, this, this IP address or this domain is exhibiting a, a certain behavior that's anomalous and be, you should be aware. And then finally, we, we look across the data as a whole and do, conduct trend analysis we can go back in time. Uh, we can we can also look for uh, increases, decreases, spikes, things of that nature uh, across all of the data. So so the goal of the EISAC um, sp uh, specifically in CRISP is to be the strongest link for high level security situational awareness, so as to pre protect utilities, the grid, and the nation from malicious cyber actors. And so uh, specifically for CRISP, we have a unique collaboration between the government and the private industry, and it makes CRISP the only near real-time network data sharing program of its kind. Uh, finally, we, we provide invaluable context to help participants identify a path forward to help mitigate threats against critical infrastructure. And so it, we, we try to be the strongest link uh, to, to bring, provide the best service between that public and private um, so that we can enable information sharing between both public and private, as well as help mitigate and respond or mitigate um, uh, activities and report on them for for the the situational awareness of the sector. So that concludes my briefing. Uh, I believe I will hand it back over now. Great. Thanks so much, Frank, for that um, that overview. And I think it was, very helpful to talk about, um, you know, ob the obvious benefits of uh, joining an ISAC. So thank you for that. Um, and now I will pass it over to Tom. Tom, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, perfect. So, um, Thank you for the opportunity, both to the U.S. Energy Association and the USAID. Uh, and thank you, Frank, for the value that you and the East ISAC uh, contribute to the energy sector, uh, both within the North America, but also internationally because of your partnerships with the European ISAC and the Japanese 
uh, ISAC as well. So thank you. So just a backdrop, I, I'm Tom Wilson. Uh, I am the Chief Information Security Officer for Southern Company. And Southern Company is, is one of the largest energy companies in North America. We offer uh, both electric, gas, and we own a wireless uh, company, a push-to-talk system, uh, Motorola Technology. So it, we have capacity in 50 states. We have assets in probably 40 some odd states, roughly 9 million customers and over 40,000 megawatts, it's 44,000 to the exact uh, of production capability. And so when we, we think about the discussion today as on information sharing, I wanted to first kind of give you a backdrop, a perspective on the electric sector's more strategic approach to grid resiliency. And so our sector is highly regulated by multiple regulators, so the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, both are regulators uh, for our sector. But regulation, in the cyberspace is really only a floor for managing resiliency. It's sort of the, the minimum and that many companies, most companies within the sector do more uh, than the, what the regulations require. So industry and government partnerships, programs, exercises, they all form a foundation for a truly resilient North American grid. I mean, that's the outcome that we are looking for. That includes things like our mutual aid processes. You know, there, there, there's a hurricane just hitting us right now, and that may come into play where utilities all help each other recover from all manner of threats. So it might be, you know, natural weather type events, uh, hurricanes, ice storms, um, you name it. Um, it could be responding to pandemic impacts. It could be responding to cyber um, and so it includes that the mutual aid process includes things like spare equipment. So shared spare equipment inventories um, for crisis kind of situations. And then it goes all the way down to exercises. So every other year sponsored by uh, the NERC organization, um, we do cyber and physical exercises uh, for North America. And uh, that's an excellent process. Information sharing is a key piece of that foundation, and that's the discussion today. And it's a continued focus for our industry and our U.S. government that we work very closely with. And it's an area that I'd like to see even more international cooperation, particularly in the energy sector. And when I say energy, I think broader than electric and gas, like the company that we are, that would also include the, the upstream energy, which would include the big oil companies. Uh, as an example. And so information sharing enables the early detection of threats based on the experience of peers. So it's an opportunity to improve your detection capabilities, increases your situational awareness of both your own threats and threats that might be more broadly in your system, um, in your peer set, in your sector, and maybe even in your supply chain. And it's also an opportunity to learn and improve. So the North American grid is interconnected. And so raising the situational awareness and maturity of peers raises the resiliency for all. And so information sharing maturity sort of begins with the, you know, the very technical details that are often referred to as the focus of information sharing. That includes indicators of compromise, things like IP addresses, internet URLs, the, the web addresses where an attack may be coming from, maybe the signature for a file, the hash value of a file that is known to be malicious. That's sort of a starting point. And then it moves up the chain of value to understanding and predicting and then responding to the adversary's tactics, what's often called tactics, techniques, and procedures, or TTPs. Um, 
that is something that you know, the, the adversaries can change the tactical things, the indicators of compromise very quickly. And then they design their attacks to actually change those all the time um, so that there's less value over time in using the more operational information sharing practices. It's much harder for them to change their, their tactics and, and how they go about doing things. And so that's a level of maturity and in information sharing. And then up the chain from that, you, you have, you know, benchmarking and sharing of how you architect and secure your systems um, and work to improve what you are doing. Um, and, and I think that's a different way of thinking about information sharing, best practices, architectures. Those are very, very high value, particularly when you're talking within a peer set or with companies that are more mature than your own. So the journey to effective information sharing is impacted by what I refer to as, as circles of trust. So the greater the trust that you have with an individual or a company or a government agency, the easier it is to be open with that entity and fully disclose a full gamut of information of what's happening within your company, what you're experiencing, what the impact might have been. And so if you think about your own willingness to share within your own company, you know, there's probably a lot of willingness to share within your company, at least with people that have a need to know. Then think about what's your willingness with very close peers, people that you may know within your sector um, or who may live in the area and have a similar job um, or across sectors. So people that are in similar sectors, but maybe not the same that you're in. And ultimately with government agencies and how you collaborate and work with the governments where your company is located. And so the closer to the inner circles one gets, the more companies and people are willing to share information uh, that they have about threats to their network or impacts to their network and how others may be able to defend against the same thing. So think about your own circle and how do you get more peers within your sector, outside your sector, with your government partners closer to your inner circle so that you can enable that type of sharing. And so there's a variety of trust groups um, that you can work with. It does include your, your government. In this case, for us, it is the U.S. government. We're a U.S. only entity. Uh, but if you're in more countries or in different countries, there, there'd be different opportunities here within your industry. So we have a variety of platforms that we'll share within the industry, both the EISAC and the CRISP program. Um, Frank mentioned both of those. There are also third parties um, that you can work with that does a great job of producing intelligence and information that you can act on. Uh, most of these are pay um, there are open source sites as well that you can gain information from. VirusTotal is, is uh, one of those. And so continuing on the scheme with each information sharing partner and venue that you may have, th there's obviously further breakdowns within that of how you gain access to people within those groups, whether they're local to you, whether it's a trusted peer uh, for whatever reason that is, your industry consortiums, um, your lobbying groups, there's, there's a lot of different ways these can be broken down, even with the government agencies, there can be a system sector specific agency like there is for Southern company that is the Department of Energy, uh, but there's also law enforcement agencies as well as the intelligence community. Um, so all of those come into play in thinking about how you do sharing with each of those different types of entities. Um, and our relationships and our trust can vary across all of those. But the goal is to mature and bring more value ultimately to enable more sharing with more peers and more government agencies. Cyber is a worldwide fight. We are all in this together. We have to find ways to work together and information sharing is one of the tools that enables that. Frank 
and the EISAC are tremendous partners for the energy sector within North America. And so I, I mentioned exercises before. Um, it, it may not be obvious, but exercise is a key part of information sharing. So as a part of the national exercises we do, we do this uh, every other year. Um, so every two years, there's a national exercise for North America. So we test our information sharing processes as a part of that exercise. How fast would an attack on one be disseminated to more companies? How fast would it be disseminated to the industry? How fast would industry be aware of potential mitigations? Um, how fast would they have even situational awareness? Those are the type of things that we test. The exercises are also an opportunity to share best practice, um, maybe on the architecture of defenses. If there are utilities, a part of the exercise who are able to minimize the impact, if they look at the attack as part of the exercise and say, this is how we would defeat that, we're well architected against that threat. Um, then that may be a utility that's got some best practices that should be shared more broadly. Um, can also be best practice sharing for incident response. Who responds um, effectively? Who recovers effectively? Who communicates effectively and why? And what can we all learn from that? So great opportunities. So another approach, um, a number of companies, both within the electric sector as well as in financial and healthcare, is a situational awareness platform, a collaboration platform. It's called IronNet, is publicly available third party product. Uh, so, this is not free, uh, to be very clear. Um, it was founded by the former director of the National Security Agency. And the platform allows companies to see what is happening within their sector and even across sector in comparison to what's happening on their own networks. And you can see commonalities and anomalies that you may have. And cases um, can be worked together or prioritized your response based on that data. So it's a focus and an efficiency play. So if another company were to have a similar threat, a similar anomaly as you have in your network, and they've already acted on it, and they either flag it as a false positive, in that case, you can deprioritize acting on that, which gives you some efficiency, or if they flag it as a high risk, then you know to prioritize that and go after that, which reduces your response time to a threat. So this is something a number of companies are working together on. So with information sharing, there's a number of lessons learned. So understand the sharing that actually creates value. Look at what you're doing from an information sharing. Make sure the things that you're working on are actually creating value for you, you know, after you've done it for a certain period of time. You need to prioritize the sources based on the value you're receiving. You may have a source of intelligence and information that just is creating false positives, which creates work for you, or just doesn't produce any value. So you don't have to understand where you're getting the value. Over time, move from the operational indicators of compromise to the tactics, techniques, and procedures of the adversary and act on those and design your program around those. And ultimately, good sharing requires automation to be able to pull the information that you're getting from a variety of sources automate it into your systems, both to be able to detect threats tied to that information, as well as actually to be able to respond to those threats. And that's sort of the approaches ultimately you wanna to get to automating this as much as you can. And so our own plans moving forward, you know, obviously we're looking for a post COVID world. A lot of this is relationship oriented. I talked about circles of trust that's linked to relationships. That's easier to do in person. It just is. Um, the, all of the virtual opportunities like we're doing now are fantastic, but sometimes it, it works to be in person. We're continuing to work on our tabletop exercises to continue to learn and grow, working on our playbooks, 
uh, refining our process. But ultimately, we're working really, really hard on ingesting intelligence and information in an automated fashion and trying to automate the response to that information and intelligence. That is kind of where our focus is right now. So to wrap this up, closing thought, think about where your own sources of information sharing are coming from. Do you have the network that you need? Which ones of those are valuable? How can you expand your own sources? Maybe companies in your area, in the city that you live in or the region that you live in, can you expand to other companies? They don't even have to be in your sector. Um, your sector companies, either within your country or if you happen to be a utility in a country where you're the only utility, then reach out to the countries around you uh, that you can work with um, in your region. Information sharing and analysis centers are great partners. There's one here in North America, there's one in Europe, and there's one in Japan. Um, great opportunities to work. Um, maybe your cross-sector closely aligned peers, like I mentioned with uh, in energy, that might be the big oil companies. And that might be your suppliers um, who sort of, there's an impact to you if they're impacted, but they're in the same value chain. And those may be people that you can work with. Clearly your government agencies, your government partners are um, places to think about sharing with, and then your vendors. Again, that goes back to your supply chain. So with that, I will turn it back over to Jake and I think he'll open it up with questions. Thank you, Tom. Um, you brought up a lot of key points. I mean, the, the title of the webinar is Key Elements of, of Trusted Collaboration and in Information Sharing. And uh, I think you really um, hit the, the nail on the head um, when you talked about, you know, circles of trust and, and traffic light, light, traffic light protocols. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we have a couple questions from the audience. Um, the first one is, uh, ISAC is well applicable to a huge country like the US um, and friendly neighbors like Canada. Um, but how could a, a small country similarly avail such information um, across sharing borders. Um, so Frank or Tom, either of you want to take a stab at that one? So uh, this is Frank. Uh, I, I would uh, begin with uh, what, what Tom is, uh, was talking about with circles of trust. So, so the, the concept of an ISAC, I think uh, it formed out of roughly 20 years ago or so. Uh, it was a presidential uh, 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 declaration from the United States side, um, but it, it really started as a small group of utilities that that wanted to come together in some way, shape, or form and and share. Um, and so it started out small and it slowly built, um, and eventually it, it found its home in NERC. Um, and then in, in, in NERC. It's grown from there from roughly, I think, a handful of, of staff to over 40 at this point. Um, I, so I, I think it's, anything like this needs to start small, and it, it begins with a, a small circle of, of trusted individuals or utilities in this case, and then beginning to broaden out and build upon success. Uh, Tom, what do you think? Yeah, yes, yeah, so I totally agree. So you laid out sort of that's how NERC uh, came to be. If you look at the more recent ones, both the European, the EEISAC, and, and the JEISAC over in Japan started small. Um, and they're relatively new. And so you want to get a group of um, companies that can work together, whether that's within a country or maybe even that's across countries. And then look at, as you're just working together individually, can you then produce a small amount of funding from each company to be able to build a small ISAC and start from there and then grow the number of companies that are engaged and ultimately increase the funding and the capability. The other thing you can do is bring your governments into the fold and try to get government funding to help stand up that ISAC because the threat to critical infrastructure companies is a national security issue for every government. And so I think there's a play for governments to get involved and maybe help companies start those up. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we have another question from the audience uh, regarding trust. So companies are increasingly outsourcing staff um, and are managing remaining staff with more 
performance demands and less loyalty. How does a uh, demanding performance culture uh, kind of play in with trust? So, so I'll, I'll take that. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but you know, I'll, I'll throw an additional challenge in. Um, <laughs> it's not specific to information sharing, but it is a threat that is involved in information sharing and that's insider threat. And so um, our company has a um, value that we call unquestionable trust. And so how do you implement an insider threat program inside a company that tells their employees are, are one of our key values, one of four key values is unquestionable trust. And, and so that's a challenge of communicating to employees that all of our constituents expect us to have oversight on what is happening on our network, whether it happens to be employees, contractors, or even an aggressive third party that's gotten into the shoes of another. Um, and, and so we explain to people how we can have a value of unquestionable trust, but still need to have oversight on what's happening on our network uh, with employees that are on that network. Now, I know European privacy laws, other areas in the world can't do some of the things that we can do, but we, we do do that. So the, the question itself is a challenge when, yeah, if you've got people outsourced, they're not really part of the company. You really want to just build around a mission, whether the people work for your company or not. You want to look for people on your team who have a mission focus, who believe in what we're doing. I mean, we believe in serving our communities. And there's this mission focus of what we do is critically important. Right now, there's a hurricane that's hit the southeastern coast. Um, there's over a million customers uh, impacted at this time. And we got to get that power restored. And it's just this this lifeblood of being critical infrastructure, it's just so important. So you want to look for employees that believe in that. Um, and those are the type of people that will understand um, trust. Absolutely. Um, no, that, that, that's definitely a great point. Um, Frank, do you have any, any further comments on that question? Yeah, I, I agree uh, with what Tom said. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, for if you have a group of people as a team that are working together for a common goal or mission, um, trust will start to, to, to come between or come naturally within them um, because uh, they're going to build upon the relationships they have every day to, to every day for the task at hand. So um, it, 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 it's a cultural uh, aspect of, of within the company. Uh, and it, it's something that um, the, the individuals that are working together uh, are, are, should naturally come into a, a, a small circle of trust, if you will, for the, for the common task or the common goal that they share. Um, from there, it, it would just be the, the thought is to branch out. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and kind of going off that, um, we have another question from the audience. Um, talking about like taking initiative. So if you're a policy maker um, and not a member candidate of uh, an ISAC, um, how can you best support in the establishment of an ISAC um, and motivate stakeholders to take initiative um, in a country that doesn't have an existing ISAC? Um, Frank, you wanna, you wanna start? Sure, yep. Um, so my recommendation there is uh, from a policy perspective is um, find a, a group of utilities or a, a small group of utilities that would want to um, uh, engage in something like an ISAC. And then from there, it, it's uh, looking at why you would need one. And, and really, frankly, as Tom was saying, the, the case is very simple. Cyber is, a, is, is a, everyone's in the cyber fight. Uh, cyber crosses borders. Uh, cyber knows no bounds at this point. So, uh, from a from a, a perspective of why you you would need some type of uh, collaborative information sharing and analysis center, cyber is a sure shot. Um, regardless of the size of your nation, I'm sure there's physical threats. I mean, in, in the United States, we're a very large, broad nation, and there's plenty of physical threats to to physical infrastructure at utilities like substations. 
I mean, every week we get reports of, you know, gunshots at, at uh, substations or transformers or things of that nature. And I would believe a small nation would similarly have physical issues as well. Uh, so so that, that's why our primary focus is on those two. Um, another one that lurks is the physical or the supply chain issue. Um, we don't, we, everyone that's uh, been, everyone that is in this industry uh, is, is affected by supply chain um, and uh, the concerns of, of uh, individuals putting uh, bad things in the supply chain or ending up with bad products. Um, so those are three highlights from a policy perspective that you can take back and, and expound upon in, a, in an attempt to, to uh, promote why we you, you would need an ISAC or justify the, the importance of an ISAC. Because for, especially for those three, the information that's being shared to that, that central point gives a purview across to everyone. Um, so for, for the EISAC, for example, <clears throat> all the information that comes in from all of our members, what we can look across all of that. And what we can tease out is, trends within that, that of things that may be affecting all our members or um, uh, we can look at instances so we can gauge you know has there been an increase in the northwest for you know gunshots against uh, you know substations because then that might be an invest investigative jump off point start pivoting and doing more work to figure out well why is this increase occurring you know um, so I, I, I from a policy perspective you, it, it, you can make a case there's plenty of, of things happening in the news. Um, not just uh, in the United States, but around the world uh, to, to put together a, a solid case. And then from there, it's finding the utilities, a small group that would want to participate and, and work to put something together because there, there will be some work. There, there's definitely going to be some negotiating and, and uh, figuring out funding models and things like that because um, not all ISACs are the same for funding. So for EISAC, I, just, I see the second or I see the question. So our, our funding model uh, for the ISAC is it's free to everybody. Um, uh, it is funded through um, uh, NERC. NERC is funded by assessments and assessments are essentially contributions from uh, members of uh, NERC. So electric power utilities that are members of NERC provide a small amount of funding, each of them. And all of that funding then comes back to NERC and a portion of that goes to fund the EISAC. Now there's there's other ISACs uh, like the financial services ISAC, which is a strictly pay to play model. So it, I think they have uh, tiers and, and depending on how much you pay, it dictates which tier you're in with the highest tier giving you the, the best service and the lowest tier giving you uh, just like the base service. Um, but it, it, for them, for them, there is no free uh, you, 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 to join the FSI SAC. There is a, a, a fee up front, and that's that would be part of the policy discussion too. Of if you if you look to establish an ISAC in your country, then what would the model be, the financial model? Um, I would also advocate for for um, individuals who may be on here in, that are in Europe. Uh, so you have the uh, uh, European Electric uh, ISAC. Um, to reach out to them for more information and, and especially if you're a utility, see about joining. Absolutely. Um, thank you for, for that, um, that long answer for both questions, but I think uh, you brought up a, a lot of really good points. Um, Tom, do you have any advice on uh, establishing uh, ISACs? Yeah, uh, um, I love what Frank said. He, he really laid it out. You know, the thing I would say to policymakers um, and or regulators is, is whatever um, opportunities that you have to convene uh, those for who you make policy for. I mean, it's a discussion. Sit, sit down with those companies and ask questions around how are you doing information sharing today? What do you think about information sharing? What are your sources of information? How can you better work together? Do you have access to an ISAC? Should we create an ISAC? If we create an ISAC, what does that look like? How do we go about doing that? Um, so I, I think there's an opportunity to do that for policymakers and regulators. Absolutely. Um, and and we kind of touched on this uh, a little bit earlier, um, but th I think this is more for Tom. Um, do you see any opportunities to partner with uh, global utilities on cybersecurity um, and, and how can that be kind of beneficial for your utility as well? Yeah, so um, it, it's interesting. We are a US only entity, um, primarily have been historically based in the Southeast. We have since expanded, you saw the map, we're in about 40 US states, but our you know, historical base has been 
um, the southeastern United States, and and yet I'm very engaged uh, internationally, and I think there's opportunities for companies in the energy sector to do more internationally. We all have the same threats. We are largely dealing with the same adversaries, uh, criminal and other. Um, we're dealing with the same type of attacks. And we're using the same systems, particularly when you get down to the industrial control systems, those things that are um, extremely important to our businesses. Where There's not a large set of those types of systems that we're all using the same thing. And so I think more international collaboration is necessary because we're all in this fight. And I think we would all benefit by doing more internationally to share information um, I've been to Europe multiple times meeting with utilities uh, over in Europe. I have been to Japan multiple times meeting with both their government uh, and the utilities there. And I think there's opportunity for companies like mine and companies, you know, uh, uh, across the world for, to figure out how do we work together better as a sector. Um, there, there's just so much opportunity there. It's harder right now. Um, but it can be done. We're all working virtually. There are ways to figure it out. And when travel becomes more the norm, we'll see even more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and we're definitely waiting for those uh, travel restrictions to be lifted as well. Um, Frank, do you have any you know, experience or um, can you kind of touch upon uh, the importance of, of international collaboration? Because I mean, we like Tom said, we, we kind of are all in this fight together um, to protect our critical infrastructure. Um, and a lot of utilities are, um, you know, kind of going through uh, different stages of, of um, implementing cybersecurity protocols. Um, so can you, you talk a little bit about um, international collaboration, Frank? Sure. Um, yeah, international collaboration is exceedingly important, and, and, and the best example I can provide is um, typically with, with uh, from thinking with us from a cyber perspective, uh, campaigns start in one place and move around the world, uh, it's kind of like what we're experiencing right now with COVID. So uh, it, it, an, an actor may be, a malicious cyber actor may be experimenting with a capability in one place in the world. But give it give it a little time, and that that, that capability will start showing up everywhere else. Um, so so from a a, a a perspective of information sharing before the fact. So uh, if, if you know European ISAC is is experiencing some anomalous uh, cyber activity, and they share that information with us, it informs us to be on the lookout for it because eventually it will come. Similarly, the, the, with the Japanese ISAC or the Canadian IESO. Um, uh, the, 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 there's opportunities there from an international perspective to, to identify things that are impacting or affecting them and then take that internally to, to the ISAC here and start looking for those behaviors. Um, and it happens, it happens quite often. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I'll kind of wrap it up there, um, but thank you all for, for joining us for this webinar. Um, uh, and thank you both Frank and Tom. And I think that was, um, you guys both uh, did a great job at, at kind of uh, making the case for establishing ISACs and improving uh, collaboration uh, among the, the energy sector. Um, so to all our attendees, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, there's a quick survey after the webinar um, and your participation is greatly appreciated. Um, if you have any comments, my email is on the, the screen right now. Um, please feel free to send them to me. Um, we will be posting a recording of this webinar um, and the PowerPoint presentations on our website. Um, and uh, other than that, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week and weekend. Um, so thank you for joining us and stay safe, everyone.